A man is robbed and almost killed on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. The attitude of those who robbed him can be summarized as follows. What is yours is mine, and I'll take it. A priest and a Levite, supposed paragons of righteous living, bypass the victim. The priest sees him, but tries to convince himself that he didn't actually see anything. He figuratively closes his eyes to the man's plight. There are people out there who live in a world where they don't see stuff because they feel that if they don't see, they can't be held responsible for what they don't see. The second passerby, we're told, is a Levite. And we're told that he comes over and he gawks. His eyes are open, but his heart is closed. All of this occurs in spite of the fact that these two religious men would have been aware of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16, which says, Thou shalt not stand idly by the blood of thy neighbor. Instead, the attitude of these two religious leaders seems to have been, What's mine is mine, and I'll keep it. A Samaritan then approaches the scene with both open eyes and open heart. The Bible tells us he quickly opens his heart to the injured man's condition. He was moved to assist. His attitude toward the victim might be summarized as follows. What's mine is yours, and I'll share it. According to one Bible commentator, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notorious for ambushes and was commonly referred to as the Red Way or the Bloody Way. Thus, given these circumstances, the illustration that Jesus used was not without realism to his listeners. Indeed, they might well have been sympathetic to passers-by who opted not to render assistance to a victim of robbery in the interest of self-preservation. I also suspect that they might have considered anyone who stopped to render assistance to such a victim to be somewhat naive as to the potential dangers lurking along this particular road. Jesus himself knew this road quite well, and Luke chapter 10 verse 38 suggests that Jesus traveled along a section of this road immediately after relating this parable, as he headed for Bethany to visit his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Based on the behavior of the Good Samaritan, one of my colleagues has suggested that while he may have been a good man, he definitely was not a good economist. You see, the notion of self-interest is so central to neoclassical economics that economists have a hard time rationalizing why people would be Good Samaritans. Indeed, I once heard it said that after a course in economics, people are apt to behave more selfishly. Let us look at these three individuals in the parable again. First, the priest. If we wanted to, we could rationalize the behavior of the priest in the parable. Based on laws laid out in Leviticus chapter 21 and Numbers chapter 19, a priest would be ritualistically unclean for seven days after coming into contact with a corpse. So if our priest was on his way to Jerusalem to perform some religious rites at the temple, he might well have decided that stopping to offer assistance might make him lose his turn to perform these religious rites. Still, we must acknowledge that his actions are contrary to what we would expect based on our Christian ethic. On to the Levite. I find it somewhat unfortunate that the New International Version offers up an identical set of circumstances confronting both the priest and the Levite. In the King James Version, verse 32 reads as follows, And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. The suggestion in the King James Version is that the Levite was at least a gawker. And while he would not have had strict conditions governing his behavior, such as the priest would have had, one could, if one so desired, attempt to rationalize his unwillingness to offer assistance to the injured man. The man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He, the Levite, was going to Jerusalem to assist in the temple. Sorry, I might have been able to help if we weren't going in opposite directions. Finally, to the Samaritan. Samaritans were, in the eyes of Jews, a defiled race of people. They were the descendants of Jews who had intermarried with the Assyrians after the Assyrians had taken over their region, the northern kingdom called Israel, over 700 years earlier. If you're curious about this story, you can find it in 2 Kings chapter 17. Sure, both Jews and Samaritans claim Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their forefathers. But Jews so despised Samaritans that when traveling from Judea to Galilee, many Jews would opt to take the longer route, crossing the Jordan twice, rather than passing through Samaria. It was also non-kosher for Jews to accept food or drink from Samaritans. You may recall the conversation mentioned in John chapter 4 between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. The woman said to Jesus in verse 9, How is it that you, a Jew, 
would ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water. You have nothing to draw water with, and Jews won't use utensils that Samaritans have used. Talk about an inferiority complex. She was a Samaritan and a woman. How is it that you, a Jew, would ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water? The Samaritan in our story appears to have had his own business to take care of. Yet when several opportunities opened up for him to be a good citizen, he rose to these occasions without so much as a murmur. Like the two other passers-by, he also had the opportunity to be open-eyed. But verse 33 tells us he saw the man, but unlike the other two, he turned the opportunity to be open-eyed into the opportunity to be open-minded. The realization that the victim might have been a Jew did not dissuade the Good Samaritan. He took the opportunity to overcome any racial or religious prejudices between Samaritans and Jews in his quest to offer the needed assistance. In Luke chapter 6 verses 27 and 28, Jesus commands us, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. There may have been several good reasons for this Samaritan man to keep going on his journey. Let us say he was on a business trip. He was quite a ways from home. He was in a foreign land which was hostile to people of his race. He was on a dangerous road. The injured man probably was a Jew, as the bandits probably might have been. But this good Samaritan, he turned the opportunity to be open-minded into the opportunity to be open-hearted. Verse 34 tells us he came toward the man, putting his own life at risk, since he had no knowledge as to whether the robbers had left the area. He was willing to take a chance. Beyond using the available resources to patch up the injured man, the Samaritan also took the opportunity to be open-handed. Verse 34 continues, He bandaged up the wounds, pouring his own precious wine and oil on them. He acted on what he knew was the right thing to do. He put the man on his own donkey and walked until he could find a place where he could take care of the injured man. He was willing to sacrifice his time, his possessions, and his personal plans to take care or to look out for this man's welfare. The Bible tells us that the next morning, the Samaritan had the opportunity to be open-ended in his dealings with another man. Verse 35 tells us he gave the innkeeper two days wages and asked him to watch over the man with a promise that when he returned, he would compensate the innkeeper for any additional expenses toward taking care of the injured man. In this open-ended agreement, he trusted the innkeeper to honestly keep track of any expenses which were incurred in taking care of the victim. Jesus' juxtaposition in this story of a good Samaritan and insensitive Jewish religious leaders may have so inflamed the sensibilities of the Jewish lawyer that when in verse 36 Jesus asked him which of these three was neighbor to him that fell among thieves, the lawyer just could not bring himself to say the Samaritan. All he could mutter was the one who had mercy on him.